Well, a warm welcome for all of you watching around the world, as well as those of you in the classroom as we continue our study on spiritual gifts. This is session 31, and we'll be talking about the gift of giving today. In our last session, we talked about the spiritual gift of shepherding. And we said these are people whom God gives special responsibility for a group of Christians. That shepherding actually means pastor. You can translate the word pastor to shepherding in the Greek. And there's some question whether the list in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13, where it lists pastor, teacher, is one word or two. And commentators differ on this. I prefer to think that they're both right, that it is a gift where a pastor must be a shepherd and be tender and caring and a teacher who provides instruction and who ensures that the body of Christ grows up and matures. There's also some question of whether there is a gift separately of shepherding and a separate gift of teaching, and I believe that that is true. Well, let's move on today to our discussion of the spiritual gift of giving. It is actually the first spiritual gift that I've associated with the hands. And again, I want to mention this is not biblical. This is simply a, a device for us to be able to remember the gifts and associate them with the functions that they're used for. There's a college on the west coast of uh, the United States. It's a well-known Christian college and they were going to take part in their graduation ceremonies. There were three students who were being recognized for very distinguished performance, academic performance, during their four years in the school. And they were meeting with the president of the university and the trustees of the university. And they walked out and got ready to walk out of the tunnel to go onto the football field where they were going to hold the ceremonies. And the president stopped everyone and said, before we go out, I just want to say a word to our three graduating seniors. You owe a great deal of money to this university. You owe approximately $100,000 in loans. And you owe maybe around $200,000. And then there's one student who owns $300,000. Altogether, it's a half a million dollars. And I want to tell you today that there's a person in this room who does not want to be recognized who has paid off your debt. You no longer owe any money to the college. And they were stunned. This is the gift of giving. Someone in that room had been blessed of God to have quite a bit of money. One half of a million dollars, $500,000, you can translate it into your own uh, currency, is a lot of money. And this person felt led of God to bless these three students who had done so well in school with a gift that they could never repay. That is the gift of giving. There are over 800 verses in the Bible that deal with the question of money. In fact, about 3% of all the verses in Scripture have to do with the question of finances, of money. It is the second most frequently topic talked about in the Bible. The one that is the most talked about is the kingdom of God, including what heaven is like. But God has quite a bit to say about money because money is often, as it says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money has done a lot of good in the world. Money has caused a lot of hardship in the world. Let's take a look at a verse that specifically talks to wealthy people and tells them their responsibility in the kingdom of God. Would you, both here in the classroom and those watching DVD, turn to 1 Timothy and we'll go to chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 17. It's right at the end of 1 Timothy. And Paul talks about money. He's talked about it previously in this chapter. And he comes back and he says a word to people that God is blessed with financial means. Starting in verse 17, Paul, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, 
command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. What a wonderful challenge to people of financial means. I know people in the kingdom of God who are very generous with what they have. Unfortunately, I know people in the kingdom of God who are not, who seldom do anything but try to make more money for themselves. It says a little bit about where they are in their sp spiritual maturity. But I prefer to think of those people who, like the couple in our church, who own a very, very nice home right down by Lake Michigan, the huge lake that uh, is near Chicago. And they open up their home every year to the students in our high school ministry for parties down by the lake in the summer. And then in August, they open up their home for the entire congregation perhaps 1,500 people who come and they uh, have baptism right on the beach next to the lake. And when they're baptized, they go out into the lake and of course they're immersed. What a wonderful tribute to uh, those people who have a lot of money and yet you would never know it. They always open up their home graciously, willingly, and with a spirit that is joyful. Then Paul talks about, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. I know a couple who also made a great deal of money, and the person was in construction. They were a construction manager responsible for bidding uh, in order to take care of an entire project. They built a lot of churches, a lot of buildings for Christian organizations, and then took their money and invested it in the stock market. In the late 90s, the stock market crashed and they lost all of their money, everything. And they had not been rich with the things that they had. And as a result, they went from a lifestyle that was very enjoyable to a lifestyle that most of us have. And it was very difficult for them. So money is one of those things, whether you're very rich or whether you're people of lesser means, like most of us, it is a challenge making sure that you use your money wisely. And so in terms of giving for all of us who are Christians, not just those who have a lot of money. And I learned a long time ago that there's a little reminder of how much money we should give, how much money we should save, and how much money we can spend. And it's called the 10 10 80 plan adding up to a hundred percent God says that we should give 10 percent as a starting point 10 percent of our wealth to him the first 10 percent so we should write a check or we should put money in at the beginning of every week every month whatever you decide and put 10 percent as the first thing we give I know that's hard for some people, but I have done that for many years and I have found God always blesses me. The money is always there for me to be able to give my tithe. But then, it isn't that 90% is mine now. We're also encouraged to save for those days that could be a little different where we need to fall back on some money we have saved. So 10% is the tithe, 10% for saving, and live on 80%. I also know people who have the gift of giving who have challenged themselves with this thought. How much is the least amount of money I could live on? And then I'll give the rest to God. And they find that a real blessing. Now for many people who are just struggling to survive, 
this is something that you look at and say, I could never do that. But you serve a God who can do the impossible. God promises in the Old Testament that test him. Give the money to him and you will find that the money you receive in return will overflow. And that as this little section in 1 Timothy says at the end, in this way you will lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. A firm foundation for the future in heaven. So will you turn now to Romans chapter 12 verse 8 where we have been many times before and we will take a look at the context of the gift of giving and then go to the Greek to understand what it means. And we will begin in uh, verse 6 where we have before continue until the gift of giving is mentioned. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. Encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. In my translation, it says contributing to the needs of others. I believe in the King James Version, it uses the word giving or give. Let's take a, it says, he that giveth, let him do so with simplicity. Simplicity comes from the term haplatus, haplatus, G572. And it means not seeking anything for yourself, being free from hypocrisy or pretense. It also has the concept of being extremely generous out of what your bounty is, what God has given you. So the word simplicity sounds a little awkward that you should be just simple in the way you give. It really means what it says in uh, the New International Version that we should give generously. So it doesn't mean the idea of being simple in your giving. It means to be generous out of the bounty you have and that the more you give, Honestly, the more God blesses you, it's like you give money to Him and He'll ensure that you have that money and even more as long as you're able and willing to give again. And God provides the means to support the body of Christ. The definition that we'll use in this session for giving is to share, supply, or donate to those in need to share, supply, or donate to those in need. And this might be the church, or it might be individual believers. Many times a church has projects, or has repairs, or has materials it needs to buy, and the budget just doesn't have the money available. And there are people who hear that, and then secretly come to the pastor and say, I'll buy that. I'll contribute to that. These are people of means. There are many people at my church who have done so, and I don't know who they are. For those who have the gift of giving, prefer to do so in secret. They don't want any self-seeking praise. They're doing it from motivations that are entirely pure. They don't want to be like the Pharisees were, very visible in giving their gift and then everyone thinks very highly of them. Now I'm not criticizing churches because every church has their own way of doing things. But it always bothers me when I go into a church and every pew and every item that's in the church has a little label on it, gift from this person, given in memory of, all very nice, but it seems like that's not the spirit of giving. That I'm not sure that they've laid up treasures in heaven. I think instead, that little plaque is all the treasure they're going to get because they did it for the wrong motivations to be recognized by people and not to do it for God's glory. The purpose of this gift is to be God's channel for providing financial or material means. It's as though you are the person who is the conduit 
God gives it on this end, it comes out on this end. And you become the one who is blessed, knowing that you have blessed others. There is a concept called secret sacrifice. And what it means is all Christians can do this, whether you have the gift of giving or not. You hear of someone who is in need, and then secretly you meet that need. Someone is struggling and they don't have enough money for food or medicine. And you, without writing a check where they would know who you are, you send cash to them. Or you go get a um, currency that will just simply have the amount that they need and their name. It is a joy to do that, to know that you have met the need of another person in the body of Christ who is in need. And you can do this whether you have a lot of money or just a little. And I promise you, God's word is true. Be rich in your giving and you'll be blessed richly in your giving. The role of giving is managing the church. Now you might think it's caring for the church, but this is really about church operations, ensuring that the church has the resources it needs to run smoothly. And it has a component of caring in the fact that if you're working with an individual, it's taking care of their needs. So it depends on the context in which it's being used. The gift mix that often this comes with is the gift of mercy, the gift of encouragement, the gift of administration, and the gift of discernment. That last one, think of carefully. If you have the gift of discernment, you could discern whether or not the person's supposed need is genuine. Because there are people who claim to not have the money, and they really do. And they want the church to supply their need, and they would have more than what they need. You'll remember in an earlier session, we talked about Ananias and Sapphira, who sold a piece of property, kept some of it back for themselves. Peter used his gift of discernment, and each of those spouses, husband and wife, when they were challenged by Peter, said, yes, we gave it all to the church, and they died. And we've said that was a strong message to the church, the early church, not to try to fool God because God knows all things. In our case, I doubt that it means physical death, although it could. It probably means spiritual death. Death itself means separation. When a person dies, the body is separated from their spirit. The body is an empty shell, the spirit goes to heaven. Much in the same way that you are separated from your fellow believers as well as being separated from God. I went to the commentators as I've done in the past and I went to some of the same commentators I've looked at before. I use many of the same ones because I have confidence in uh, their uh, descriptions, their accounts, their opinions. They are people who have been over the years used by many other people and therefore they have some more credibility than some others. Carl Westerlin says, giving is the ability to know how and when to give of your possessions and to do so not having mixed motives, not doing it to be self-seeking. Ministry Tools, whom I have used before and I love their definitions, says giving is to share what material resources you have with liberality, meaning generosity, and cheerfulness without thought of return. When people give and they have the gift of giving, they're never thinking they're going to see that money again. And they're joyful about that because they know God will give them even more so they can be this channel, this conduit of even more blessings to people. Matthew Henry is the only commentator I found that associates this with the office of deacon. You'll remember we talked about how the apostles couldn't handle all of the responsibility, all of the tasks of the early church. And so they said, appoint for yourselves seven men of good character and they will take care of distributing the food to the widows. 
and we will concentrate on the ministry of the Word. In many churches, you will have two offices. You will have the office of elder or some other title who are responsible for the spiritual welfare of the whole church, and then you have a group called the deacons who are responsible for the tasks that need to be taken care of around the church. And they're especially responsible to help those in need. Sometimes we call that benevolence in a church. Uh, it is simply helping those in need with financial resources and doing that privately. Matthew Hanner believes that the gift of giving is associated with that office. I don't find that in any other commentators, but I think it would be good if the gifts of, of giving is associated with anyone who aspires to the office of deacon. And finally, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say it is to exercise privately your benevolence, not publicly, and to do so joyfully. So he says it's a private sort of thing. It's not something that uh, the public in general knows about it, and it's certainly not something that the recipient of the generosity knows about. The visual aid I'd like you to think of is a dollar bill, a ruble, a mark, a euro, a pound, a franc, a yen, a peso, whatever your currency is, think of that bill. And that that bill, representing money, is a means to bless someone else. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. You know, we focused on money in this session, but I would be doing an injustice if I, if I didn't mention that the gift of giving is not just about money. God has given us money as a resource, but He's also given time as one of our resources. Each of us has the same amount of time every day, every month, every year. No one gets more time than anyone else. And the idea of being uh, rich in giving is to give of your time as well, to go to church and help out on projects, to go and be a part of a larger community that is doing some uh, larger missions project to help supply the needs overseas. But it isn't the only resource that God has given you. He's given you money, He's given you time, but He's also given you your talents, your abilities, your natural abilities. I know of people who come to church every week and they help in the office by uh, sending emails on the computer, by keeping track of the budget, by filing things away, taking care of correspondence, and they do so with joy because they're giving of their time, they're giving of their talent, and we are to give of our treasure. You may have heard of these, this little trio before, and maybe it only translates in English because it all starts with a T. You are given time, talents, and treasure. And all of those you are responsible for, whether you have a gift or not. When you stand before God and you give an account for your life, He will ask you, what did you do with all that I gave you? And as a believer, you will give an account for how did you use your time, how did you use your talents, how did you use your treasure, and how did you use your spiritual gifts. And I believe for the first three, it's the same thing as the tithe. Did you donate 10% of your time, 10% of your talent, 10% of your treasure, or more for the kingdom of God? Can we turn, please, in our Bibles to Mark chapter 12, where you have heard this story before, but it is a fascinating story. It's called the story of the widow's might. <clears throat> it is a story about a woman whose husband has passed away, who is living 
a life of survival. She does not have much money, but she has the gift of giving and she has the joyful spirit. As we look at the very end of chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, Jesus notices something and uses a teachable moment, a moment that comes up in his life and he says, ah, here's some, a lesson I could teach the disciples. And so he didn't plan this, it happened, and as a good teacher does, used it to teach his disciples. In verse 41, uh, Mark writes, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny, only a little bit of whatever the most uh, little, least currency is you have at your, in your country. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. First of all, Jesus had discernment to know what this woman had done, and he knew what her motivations were. And he was saying, it's not how much money you give, it's what your attitude is in giving. Is it a joyful attitude? It is an attitude of generosity. Is it one of going over and above, believing in faith that God will provide for your needs? This is an amazing story because this woman had nothing and she gave all she had, everything. Talk about having faith that God would provide for your needs. This woman really was out on the edge, teetering back and forth. And Jesus, I am sure, blessed her for her generosity. I'll give you a personal example as I've done before. I have two friends of means named John and Jan. And they have blessed my family more than I could ever thank them for or tell you about. They are people of tremendous means. They own a second home, if you can imagine, up north of Chicago in the state of Wisconsin, which is a place that many people go for vacation. They own it right on a lakefront. They have a sailboat. They have a powerboat. They have these things called ATV, all-terrain vehicles, four wheels and you drive around and they have skis and they have all of the different things that make things fun when you're on a vacation. Throughout the time that my children grew up, they would invite my family to come up with their family and to enjoy a long weekend together of refreshment, of doing these kinds of things. And when I ask my children, what is it that you remember most about growing up? They always talk about their times with John and Jan and their family and how much fun they had and how much fellowship there was. And I am eternally grateful to them that they shared what they had. And you would never know that they did it for every, any reason other than they wanted to bless my family. I have some questions for you. Please ask them of yourselves. If you answer yes to these, perhaps you do have the gift of giving. But I also want to mention, many of you do not have the means to give, and so I want you to look at your heart and say, is this something that moves my heart that I would want to do, should God provide the means to me? Has God worked through you to, first, provide the church with financial and material resources it needs for ministry? Second, has God worked through you to help the needy anonymously, without any credit, without any recognition, without any fanfare? And third, has God worked through you to share your resources with others and to do so willingly and joyfully?
If you answered yes to any of those, both because you have done it or you would love to do it, then perhaps you do have the gift of giving. It is a wonderful gift that blesses the church and blesses so many of God's people. Well, join us next time when we'll continue our study of spiritual gifts, looking at gifts associated with the hands, and this time we'll look at the gift of helps. So thank you for joining us.